Hello and welcome to what will probably be my last reflection for some time. I'm thankful for those of you that have joined and I hope that, as I've always said, it is a blessing and that perhaps I made you think a little. It's been a great privilege for me. But now the churches are opening and we can see people face to face and that again is a joy just to talk to people, have a cup of coffee and come the day that we can hug one another as the family of Jesus in this place. And of course, if we have to, we can always come back to YouTube. But it's much better when it's live, isn't it? With that in mind, I have decided for my last reflection to give you a challenge. I know that I'm quite known for this. But I think it's an apt one because it's the words that Jesus spoke just before he ascended to heaven. And you'll find them in Matthew 28, right at the very end. And it says this, Then Jesus came to them. He said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, so you must go and make disciples of all nations. Baptise them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and you can be sure that I am with you, even to the very end. This is not a request. It's a command, or a demand, whichever way you want to look at it. So you must go and make disciples of all nations. It's not, well, please, if you get around to it, well, you know, maybe you'll just tell your person so. Or please, will you go and do this? It's you will go, you must go. It's a very proactive command. Some of the commands that Jesus gave are a little bit sort of passive. Loving God is a classic one because it's reciprocal. We love God because he first loved us. Loving your neighbour can be both. Sometimes it's quite hard to love a neighbour that perhaps doesn't love you. As far as do this in remembrance of me, it is quite passive because we are taking rather than giving. But this command is a very active command. It's a case of get moving command. Don't just sit there. Let's not have these holy huddles where we're all navel gazing and looking round and enjoying our services, thinking only perhaps of ourselves and what we like, rather than how we can use that time to reach other people. I think sometimes it behoves us to think about what our young people in particular and what their lifestyles are like and what they actually do and what music they enjoy. And perhaps that is something for us to think about. How do we actually relate to them? And do the things that we do, are they because we like them? Or is it that they will relate to and help other people? And I leave that as a question hanging. But whatever we do, we are commanded here to go and make disciples. And I can hear people sort of going, hey, hang on a minute, Levine. No, 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 no. That's not for me. No. I can't do that. Well, the first thing I would say that God doesn't make us all alike. As you well know, we are all different and our gifts are different. The Apostle says in the epistles that some of us are called to be evangelists, some teachers, some preachers, some pastors, some prophets, some to prophesy. We've all got different gifts and they all are equally important. The thing is that we use them to extend God's kingdom and that is so important. It's equally important that we within the Christian family do our best to recognise and nurture and persuade people who've got gifts to use them as well. Putting other people before us 
making sure that they know how they are valued and that their work is also valued in the sight of God. The other thing I can almost hear you say, well, hang on a minute, how do I do this? I'm really quite frightened about it. I can't, I can't do this. God will not ask you to do things that you can't do. That's the first thing. But there's also another clue in Luke. And the reason I've given this challenge is because we are just coming up to Ascension. Now bear in mind, Ascension was 10 days before the day of Pentecost. So let's just flip over to Luke 24, which again is the last chapter of Luke. And we read there towards the end. And Jesus says this, I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but for now stay in the city, stay there until you have received power from heaven. God won't let us do things without, on our own. He is always there to back us up. And this power was the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to use your imaginations for a few minutes. Imagine you are in a church service, DCC, PCC, Bible study, and all of a sudden there's an almighty wind comes rustling round. It shakes the windows, it blows the doors in, and everything goes scuttling. You look up and you see flames of fire dancing above your brothers and sisters in Christ, that your spiritual family's head. They start speaking in strange languages. And the most timid of them go outside and start talking to everybody that's passing by. People you wouldn't even imagine would have done that. That's effectively what happened on the day of Pentecost. 120 of them were stuck in the upper room. Probably the same room where Jesus had uh, taken the Last Supper, the Passover. They were frightened. They're probably behind locked doors. They were timid. And all of a sudden the power of the Holy Spirit comes into them and makes them brave. And Peter, remember him? He was the one that had run away. He was the one that was always getting into trouble. And he's the first one out through the door to tell everybody about this good news. They're so happy and full of joy that the folks round about think that they're actually drunk. Peter has to say, hang on a minute, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. We're just filled with the joy of the Lord. And this is why. And that was the start of it. Many people came to Christ that day. And over the next few weeks, it says hundreds, thousands were added to their number. That's the difference the Holy Spirit can make. It's the difference between sort of a passive faith and an active one, in a way. I've often said, and I've said it during these reflections, that we can believe something but it doesn't actually fill our lives. We can believe in Jesus, but is he part of our life? And we can believe in the Holy Spirit, but is he part of our lives? And that's what we need to be praying for. And this Pentecost is a good time to do it. Now, as we read through the Acts of the Apostles and even on further, the apostles would pray with people. They would go and they'd become Christians and they were believers and they would say to them, have you received the Spirit, Holy Spirit since you believed? And he would lay hands on them and they would get what people, some people call the second blessing. Now I'm going to be quite controversial here because looking at the Bible, and I, I do like studying things and occasionally, you know, putting sort of bombshells into places. I can't see any evidence within the scriptures other than people spoke in tongues when they were baptised in the Spirit. That's not the same as the gift of tongues. It's the initial evidence. 
and there's certainly the denominations today that do and practice this. But enough that we feel the power of the Spirit in our lives. It's that Spirit that gives us the enthusiasm. It's that Spirit that gives us the power in ministry. It's that Spirit that gives us the drive to want men and women and boys and girls to know the Lord Jesus Christ and to know that he is the answer for some of the things that people are going through. He fills that void that people are looking for. And it's not found with money or video games or anything else. It's something more deep. And yet, if we know the Lord Jesus Christ in that way, we have the answer. And if we have, we should be so enthusiastic, we want to share it. And what a difference it would make. I said I was going to give you a challenge. And I have. Pentecost is coming. And let's ask the Lord for a new anointing. As our church is opening, we've never had the opportunity that we've got now. People have been hurting because of loss of jobs, because of bereavement, because of illness. And we have a friend that can draw near to them. And we also have got a source of power, if only we pray to tap into it. And so I pray that this Pentecost will be like none other for us and our team, that as we move forward, we will see a new anointing as people within our community have the opportunity to hear the good news in whatever way. It might be through a good turn. It might be with an arm round once we can. It might be purely and simply by picking up the telephone. But we all have a means that we can share this news and show people that Jesus is alive today and the power of the Holy Spirit is operating in our world. Amen. Let's just have a short word of prayer before I finish. O oh Lord, we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the change that it made on the day of Pentecost. We pray that you will make us hungry for that spirit, that we will want that verve and that vigour and that enthusiasm that we can bring men and women and boys and girls to know you and to know that you can answer life's deepest problems those of the spirit and the soul and so give us the faith to move mountains we ask this in your name Amen and so for the last time Pray, let's say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you once again for listening. And may God bless you. <laughs>